Hi guys, I'm Carla Garrick and this is Manch Talk. As you can see, I am flying solo without my co-host, Tammy Simmons, who is or is not, depending on who's asking, on a wonderful vacation at a undisclosed location. <laughs> oh, so I'm delighted actually to be here this week and I invited a guest to come join us. So we have Ross Connolly, who is here from AFP. That of course is Americans for Prosperity. And Ross, welcome to Mench Talk. Thanks for having me, Carla. Sure. So tell try, me. Try and fill Tammy's <laughs> shoes. It's big shoes to fill, but. We'll, well, if you just interrupt me a lot, we'll be doing just <laughs> fine. <laughs> Uh, um, so thanks for joining me today. Uh, for our viewers back home, just tell us a little bit about what is AFP and sort of what your role is there. Absolutely. I, I'm the Deputy State Director for Americans for Prosperity in New Hampshire. Uh, we're, we've been around in New Hampshire since 2008, uh, but we're in 36 states across the country. Oh, wow. um, we're based in Arlington, Virginia. Um, the hell and, mouth. <laughs> yes, I try to avoid going there as much as possible. Um, but uh, we, we really exist to, to be a grassroots organization, a permanent grassroots organization that seeks to, to work with anyone to do right, to break barriers within the institution of government, to make uh, Granite Staters' lives and Americans' lives easier to uh, attain their level of success that they're, they're looking for. So really that, that prosperity in the name, Americans for Prosperity, is, is sort of built into the model of what you guys are trying to do. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair to say fairly limited government, small government? Yes, uh, um, certainly. We, we started off really focusing on economics and you know lowering taxes, uh, reducing regulations that harm especially uh, the lowest income folks from from moving up the ladder uh, but we we've, we've expanded that uh, sin since then in the past few years um, to really include other areas of government uh, and society that that we found that economics wasn't addressing so things like criminal justice reform um, foreign policy things like that 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 uh, really economics doesn't touch but uh are, are are continually holding people back from from achieving their their american dream and so one of the things that you and i have worked with uh together on is criminal justice mm -hmm. now you you said you know it doesn't uh economics doesn't necessarily touch that i think in many ways it does and i think that one of the things that people don't necessarily understand that i sort of see as part of my life mission is economics is in everything, right? Because everything in life is trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So if we're not, you know, if we're not looking at the cost of something and the benefit of something, and if we're handing out stuff that creates incentives for different people to behave in different ways and stuff. So certainly with, with criminal justice, I do think, you know, there is there is an economic component to it because one, of course, the taxpayers are paying to incarcerate people. So we should probably, as taxpayers, be looking at how many people are we incarcerating and for what reasons. So you've done a lot of work on criminal justice. That's sort of your baby at AFP, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I focus uh, primarily on criminal justice and, uh, and labor type reforms, occupational Ooh. licensure. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been really exciting. I, I, I agree with your point that it, my point about economics was it's not directly related right. in, in the taxes, the traditional issues, but it certainly impacts communities in a huge way when you're imprisoning, especially things like the drug war. Uh, you know, putting people in, in this cycle of being in and out of prison and not being able to find a way to get out of that cycle has a direct economic impact on every community. And so that's one of the things, you know, we, we are Manch Talk, so of course, uh, you know, we talk about issues that are close to the heart of people who live in Manchester. And I'm sure you've been following along with this, you know, homeless situation that we have going on at the, at the courthouse. And, you know, there's a part of me that is sorely <laughs> tempted to go hand out like very fancy uh, invitations to invite everyone to move from there to Stark Park in the North End, you know, with Joyce Craig lives to see what happens. Because, of course, they've come in now. Uh, there was a a post that was put up, right, that said no camping. That happened maybe like two weeks ago. Then uh, they they let people know we're going to be moving you from the space. Um, 
they have now moved. I believe they're, you know, half the people have gone into some of the, the um, facilities that are being provided. And now they're talking about maybe opening up. I think some people moved to Derry. Some people moved to the west side where I live. So <laughs> I'm not very happy about that. In fact, someone tried to put a camp uh, behind my house. And, you know, that would just be a real danger because it's it's very dry back there. The school doesn't really maintain that part of the property mm -hmm. and all of that. But um, do you guys have any studies or do you know of any studies that sort of tie that idea of once people get into the criminal justice system, it tends to lead to these sort of, I mean, let me, let me ask it this way. Do you think it's fair to say that if we were to survey those homeless people, most of them would say they were somehow touched by the criminal justice system. They'd been arrested. They all have records. Do you think that's the case? I do. Uh, I'm not sure on, on the specific Manchester situation. I, I can say in homelessness in general, um, you know, it tends to be a result of you know, drug dependence, alcohol dependence, uh, and, and mental health problems. And uh, I think those people are just being left behind, whether it's in Manchester, New York City, or anywhere across the country, that uh, these top-down approaches to try and fix homelessness with these sweeping policy changes to mostly just sweep it under the rug is what it does. Uh, doesn't actually address the, the actual issues. We, what we need is community-based solutions in a bottom-up approach, instead of you know constantly coming trying to to do these, it may sound really good in a policy pitch, right. but it doesn't actually solve solve the issue. And I think there are some broad policies that we could change uh, in terms of how we address uh, drug dependence um, and, and mental health issues. And, but, and so, what would some of those be? Are those things that you're working on? Is that stuff we're going to see start to to sort of come out of the legislation or proposed policies? Or I think there's there's many policies. You know, again, you can't just take one policy and that's going to solve the issue. What we don't have magic <laughs> wands. <laughs> yeah, no matter what the politicians tell you, it's a it's a much more complicated issue than than it's always because advertised. It's, some ways, it's like a. It's a human issue, right? Like I went on a bit of a tirade on last week's show where I was trying to explain to people, like I'm a very compassionate person. You know, some people might even say I'm an empath, right? Like I really do feel for people. But I've come to this realization that I'm like, I can't help you if you won't help yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So we have so many of these policies where it's like, we're just going to make you do these things. And, and really what we're grappling with, I think certainly in Manchester, there was a letter to the editor in today's union leader where the person was like, you know, fix the problem, make the policy, make homelessness go away. And I was like, we don't have that magic wand. And I think people lose sight of that when they realize that you know, we have to admit that there is a relationship and there's a human being involved in this. And that human being also has freedom and choices, right? Mm -hmm. And so my empathy level tends to nosedive when, when I hear things like the state and I believe uh, Governor Sununu just, just um, allocated $6.5 million for homelessness in Manchester because there's this bit of a fight going on between uh, Joyce Craig, who's trying, Democrat, who's trying to make it the governor's problem, the governor who's saying it's a local problem, right? So everyone's kind of kicking the ball around, which mm -hmm. is a problem with top down. So $6.5 million just from the state now. This isn't the $10 million that the city itself has already spent. There are 365, which I remember because it's the number of days in the year, homeless people on record in Manchester. If you divide $6.5 million by 365 homeless people, that's almost $18,000 per documented homeless person in Manchester. And I guess then my question is, if we're spending that much money, how are we not getting results? What is like, what can we be doing? I really want to solve this problem and I just don't know how to do it. Big checks uh, will, will achieve short term fixes. It won't achieve the, the long term change that we need. And I think that's it's really the incentive structure within 
that whole space, uh, you know, where where we look at, you know, a drug addict as a criminal instead of somebody that's that's as you said, having a little compassion is somebody that's that's having obviously some serious issues and needs help. Um, and, and I think changing some of those incentives uh, will really start to to gradually change the problem. It's not going to be an overnight fix, but um, you know, doing things like allocating money. There, there's a uh, legislative service request for a bill uh, in, in Concord this year, uh, which is a, a carryover from last year. There was a similar bill, uh, which would allocate a, a percentage of money in the drug forfeiture fund. This is money that uh, was gained from, from somebody that was convicted of drug crimes, and uh, allocate a percentage of that towards treatment instead of where it usually goes, it usually goes towards enforcement. And I think just changing those little incentives will start to, to move us down a path where we are looking more compassionately at these, these folks and, and, and sending them, giving them the, the treatment that they, they need uh, so that they can be successful in, in their communities. Yeah, it's... it's um you, you mentioned the asset uh, forfeiture fund, right? So just uh, for our folks back home, basically how that works, and this is a shocking thing that, that happened in America. And the first time I heard about it, I was like, what, that can't be right, but it is. So this is how it works, is um, sometimes, even if you have not been convicted of a crime, a police department may take your stuff and just be like, we think this is ill-gotten gains, we're just gonna take it. So there are lots of cases where it's things like, you know, Jeeps, boats, some poor guy had cash from his grandma, he had $30,000 in the car, his grandma had just passed away, it was her life savings. They were like, you must be a drug dealer because you have $30,000 in your car, we're just gonna take it. We're never gonna charge you with anything, we're just going to take your stuff. Now, speaking about incentives, that is a bad incentive because what you have created there is you've created a money system for a police department to go, hey, I can fund stuff. And true story, they were spending that money on things like margarita machines <laughs> for, for you know, their department. So I, I'm not sure if AFP specifically worked on it, but on the federal level, there was, I think, a little bit of reform that they're talking about. At a minimum, you need to be convicted of a crime before the government could just randomly take your stuff. That mm -hmm. seems like a reasonable position. But here in New Hampshire, you guys did a lot of work, right? On So maybe tell the folks back home yeah. like what that landscape looks like. We actually we were the first uh, AFP state to engage in a criminal justice reform issue, which was civil asset forfeiture. Oh, cool. Back in, I, I believe it was 2016, we passed uh, the bill and was signed, which, which stopped the practice in New Hampshire, at least, of uh, being able to seize and then forfeit af assets without a conviction, which is the case in a lot of states across the country. It was the case before 2016 here. Um, and unfortunately, it's still the case in New Hampshire if you work in this go-around program called Federal Equitable Sharing, uh, w which is in conjunction with the federal government. Uh, there's a bill to, start to change that as well uh, this year by, by Representative Mike Sylvia. Okay, great. Um, so hopefully we can close that last loophole. Um, but that's something, you know, you look at, at polling, I know that's not the most trustworthy source <laughs> right now, but... I think it depends what you're polling, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still... Apparently no one can figure it out for, you know, presidents, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, it's certainly a flawed science, but looking at an issue-to-issue -issue basis, it's always interesting to see that data, and, and the vast majority of Americans vehemently disagree. With, with the practice of civil asset forfeiture. They view it as, as just that. It's, it's stealing from people that have not been cr uh, convicted of a crime. They could be convic you know, convicted just by an officer in a traffic stop of having too much cash. Right, and actually, I, I think it was you guys who did some program, it may have been a couple of years ago, it was at the Radisson now, whatever the new name is for it. No, well, I forget wherever it was, but it was a program where, where you had some experts come in from out of state, and one of the the issues was was this asset forfeiture, 
And I recall the story that one person told where I'm not going to get the state right, but it was somewhere down South Kentucky or, you know, Tennessee, someplace. And um, there was a highway that went from Mexico. And so you had a north south highway. And so the cars going north from Mexico were actually carrying the drugs into mm -hmm. the country. And then the cars coming south were carrying the cash back. And in this particular state, they would only set up roadblocks on the side going north to south, i.e. the side with the money. So that is one of those situations where if you look at the incentives, you're like, well, are you trying to stop the dr drugs? You know, or are you just in it for the money, right? And so that's why when we talk about economics and we talk about incentives mattering, these kinds of things are, are vital. You know, people want to gloss over it, but if you create incentive systems where you're rewarding bad behavior, for lack of a better way to explain it, then you're going to get more of the bad behavior. And to circle back to that sort of homeless problem and being the empath and all of that is again that feeling where I had to start to be like, I can't keep, you know, uh, here's five bucks. I feel bad for you. You look like you're, you know, down on your luck because it goes back to that idea. If you subsidize bad behavior, you're going to get more of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so what are the bills that are sort of coming up? Is anything that you're particularly excited about on this? I think, uh, you know, obviously with the change in, legis uh, in the legislature, um, you know, it, it'll be a tough path, tough path uh, for, for some of the, the bigger reforms in criminal justice. But uh, we're certainly looking at, you know, the changes to equitable sharing. There's a lot of bipartisan agreement on that issue. That, and that's uh, on the federal one, right? Yeah, so like that closing would closing that loophole. Yep, that would just be a bill to close the loophole where uh, agencies in New Hampshire cannot work with the feds to get around state law, which is that's the simplest way of putting it. Because it's state law that you cannot do civil asset forfeiture in New Hampshire. And that passed like 2016 or when, whenever mm -hmm. it was, and and that was like. Well, yay, great, we figured it out, we solved the problem, look at us go. And then the other side was like, oh, we'll just be creative. Now we'll start to do it this way. Do you have numbers for that? Because I know that number used to be the federal loophole. It used to be quite small compared to what they were doing on a state level. And to be fair, New Hampshire is a lot less bad oh, <laughs> than yes. a lot of places, right? You know, like we, we still have fairly ethical situations. No one's setting up a roadblock and just, you know, catching the Canadians <laughs> coming with their money. <laughs> um, but uh, are you seeing, is there a trend that more is happening through the federal side or not? Really? Oh, I, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, and, and some of it we, we would like, you know, we, we want to work together with folks and, uh, you know, we understand that, you know, we have a, a, a a drug problem in New Hampshire, and uh, we don't want to hinder, you know, the efforts on that side. So, you know, when it comes to task forces, you know, working uh, individual agencies working in in these drug task forces, that's been excluded from from the previous bills. Uh, I would imagine it will be excluded in this one, um, just to find so, some common ground with with folks who may oppose uh, the idea. But uh, it, it certainly increased in, in the amount, and there's a lot of variables there, right? right. But um, I, it, it's, it's increased in the amount that agencies are working in the federal equitable sharing program, which is uh, part of the Department of Justice. Injustice, <laughs> I like to call it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think just reining that in so that uh, I, I think there, across the country, there is an a lot of distrust in institutions right now. And uh, we need to do things that changes. Rightly, the, I think, you know, like we- In some we, cases, yes, know, yeah. We, we're, we're not really in a good place, I would say. Yeah, I, I mean, I like to to be the optimist and, and, and look at, well, how can we build that trust uh, better? And, and and part of that, I think, is is really changing those incentives, you know, things like cannabis legalization. New Hampshire is, uh, by the end of 2021, will be completely surrounded 
by states who sell cannabis in stores with stores on our borders. Yeah, and, I mean, it's... you know, that's just the, uh, and and the vast majority of New Hampshire agrees that cannabis should be legalized. Well, more than seventy percent uh, in in the last polls and surveys. And okay, fine, we'll take that with a pinch of salt. I would take it with a pinch of salt to say Might it's probably up. higher. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, part of my the way I look at something like drugs is the way I look at everything in life is I'm like, if something exists, like we can either pretend it doesn't and that, oh, what people aren't much like alcohol prohibition, right? Like people tried that, that didn't work. We're actually coming up on, I forget what the number, it might be the hundredth. No, that was last year, right? When did they legalize alcohol? I know it's December 5th because for some obscure reason, it's on my calendar. So it must be really- It's 1931. Okay, so, so I mean, it's been a while, right? But we saw under alcohol prohibition, you know, there was a lot of violence, people were dying, uh, people were blinded, the products weren't good. And I extrapolate that way of thinking about that prohibition to drug prohibition. And then I look at drug prohibition, and especially at, you know, the heroin and opioid crisis we had here in New Hampshire, where no one wanted to talk about the fact that, well, people overdose because they don't know how strong the product is that they're using. So at a minimum, if we don't want people to die from using drugs, then maybe we need to come up with some different approach. No one's going blind from bathtub gin anymore in America, right? But they were when, when we pro, uh, had prohibition. So I'm, I'm optimistic that, you know, as, as we can share more information, as we can get the, the message out there, it's like, look, we, people aren't gonna stop using drugs. Let's accept that as the baseline of where we wanna go and then decide, is this behavior we want to criminalize? We figured out with alcohol at what level we could, you know, like, okay, you can drink, drink at home. If you're going to drink and drive, you might get in trouble, you know, like that kind of stuff. And just really start to look at drug prohibition the same way, because we have incarcerated millions of people in America, you know, for, for weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's crazy. So is there an actual legalization bill that you guys are pushing or? Yes, uh, Representative Carol McGuire uh, submitted uh, the same bill from, from last year that got lost in all the- the, in the shuffle. COVID shuffle yep. um, in the legislature during the summer. Uh, but we're going to try it again. Uh, is it, that a tax and regulate, or what it's does that not? Look like? It's a compromise. It's really uh, a it, we call it uh, legalized home grow. So you could grow uh, up to twelve plants in your home. Uh, you're not allowed to sell it, um, and and then you there's also limit you know certain uh, possession that you can have of of you know concentrates, edibles, things like that. Um, but really, it, it's saying we know, you know, tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand, granite staters go into whether it's Massachusetts or Maine, purchase cannabis in those legal states, and then come back. Are we telling? Uh, are, are we saying they're all criminals that should be prosecuted? Right. Or even, you know, we we did pass decrim, which was a great step uh, to where we're finding people. It's just a violation. For Do you have numbers on that at all? Do we know how many citations are being written for violations or? I don't, I know it's still happening. You okay. see the stories, you know, consistently. Uh, and again, incentives, it's a revenue generator. Right. Um, and, and, you know, a hundred dollar fine for some people might be not a big deal, but a hundred dollar fine for other people might be you know a significant thing where maybe they they have to you know not go to the grocery store that week right you know, it's all because you know that they're using a plant that's legal you know in every surrounding state and and canada i'll point out and i mean let's just point out for a hot second it's a plant <laughs> you know it's like nature made it humans have cannabinoid receptors i'm gonna go out on a limb and say maybe you know given all the weird pharmaceuticals that you know 
you fixes this problem but gives you seven million other side effects. I heard a really great thing once about medical side effects. Is the, it was a doctor and he said, you know, Carla, they're all effects. We just decide which ones we call side effects and which one we call the medicine, right? But we know with something like cannabis, and I think it's actually tragic that after all these years of prohibition, we had to wait this long. And the way that we were able to eke out a solution to this problem was to be like, hey, this is actually medicine, right? And it's like, but we knew that for hundreds of years, thousands of years, millennia. And then, you know, crazy control freaks came along and they were like, no, I'm gonna tell you how to live your life. I'm a big fan of how about we just all live our lives and be decent human beings. Uh, so we have about three minutes left, I think. So um, any like top bill that you're excited about that you want to get activists involved with, like something you need help with maybe? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the the uh, equitable sharing bill, if, if you're interested in issues like criminal justice reform, that's something that can actually uh, actually be achieved uh, between both parties. There, there's a lot of agreement. And that's what we try to do. We, we, we like to work with, every, you know, our saying is the Frederick Do Douglass quote of work with anyone to do right and, and nobody to do evil. And, um, you know, we really take that to heart. And, you know, I work with the ACLU on a regular basis. Uh, marijuana policy project uh, on, on cannabis issues and you know if you care about those issues you know talk to your legislator talk to your your local town committee people your council people because they need to know that the vast majority of New Hampshire wants these changes to happen you know we're not saying that cannabis is good for you we're saying that we, should, <laughs> that, that, that we should stop punishing people uh, for for something that that is a very now a norm especially in New England it is a norm uh, of people using using these products and they shouldn't be put into the cycle where they 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 get prosecuted or they get they a, a decriminalization violation it shows up on your work history or, or a background check and, and then you can't get a job and it's just this this cycle that they, they can't escape. And, and we need to put an end to that and, and take a compassionate view uh, to drug use and start to, uh, you know, punishment where punishment is due, but uh, take an approach that, that gets rid of some of those collateral consequences. And, and, and to wrap up maybe, like the punishment where punishment is due is when your actions harm someone else, right? So like if you, I, I don't even really believe in the pre-crime of, uh, you know, if you're over a limit when you're driving drunk. I, I do believe if you drive drunk and cause an accident of some sort, you know, like we should throw the book at you, right? But, you know, and so I think people should also start to muddle this over where it's like, let's make sure we're, we're, we're actually addressing crimes where there is a victim as opposed to victimless crimes. So we are out of town, time. <laughs> I told you it would go super fast. Uh, thank you so much for joining oh, thanks me. Thanks for having me. And uh, for folks back home, it is Thanksgiving week, so I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you're looking for Christmas presents to buy people or Black Friday, don't forget about my book, The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope Mostly. You can find it on my website, carlagarrick.com. And I hope you guys have a fantastic holiday. Take care. We'll see you next week.